For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. For those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who are imprinted with fear like a faint line in the centre of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering, we were never meant to survive. On this, my sort of last video about the six wives of Henry VIII, we're not just here to look at the theme surrounding Catherine Parr, but it is also our chance to look back at the other wives and see how Catherine learned from the experiences of her predecessors. Catherine was well aware of the four bodies in her shadow and the lucky escape of just one. She could see the factions at court fighting with intrigue and betrayal as opposed to outright warfare. Henry held Catholics and Protestants close in the royal bosom. On the one side, he had a brother-in-law in Charles Brandon. The Howards produced two wives to Henry, though they were the beheaded ones, and they were closely related to the king through their shared Plantagenet blood. The Duke of Norfolk's son, Henry Howard, was a thug who regularly got into fights and flouted his nobility. Eventually, this came back to haunt him when Henry VIII decided he was too much of a threat and had him executed. Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester, was a veritable witch-finder general when it came to Protestants. Henry depended on him to stop the Reformation from going too far by his definition, though Gardiner secretly wanted to reverse the Reformation altogether. On the other hand, Henry had other brothers-in-law in Edward and Thomas Seymour, who were trusted implicitly with matters of state. The former was trusted to replace the king when he went on summer progresses, while the latter was made Lord High Admiral. Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, was the yin to Gardiner's yang, where he was trusted to maintain Henry's supremacy over all religious matters in England. Regardless, no one was safe from religious persecution, and no one was too close to the king to avoid the axe or the fire. And Catherine knew this better than most. She was not the first woman to have to keep her true self secret, or at least only show a fraction of her true intelligence to keep herself safe. And she's far from the last. She had more to say, more to do, and that's the real tragedy of it all. She was held back by many things, including patriarchy and even the uncleanliness of Tudor healthcare. It's time to avenge Catherine Parr. In this video, we will look through how she managed to fight and why she has more of an impact than we think. Fifteen forty six, the last full year of Henry the Eighth's reign, was one of its most dangerous. As Henry's health slowly deteriorated and his pain and paranoia increased, it was hard to know when he would turn on people, regardless of how close they were to him. Arguably, the one to take full advantage of this was Stephen Gardner. By the summer of that year, Anne Askew had been arrested for the third time in just over a year and was tortured relentlessly in the Tower of London on the rack. She was only the second woman to be tortured in the entire history of the Tower, the other being Margaret Chain in the wake of the Pilgrimage of Grace. It was seen as unconscionable to torture a woman in the same way a man would be, but Henry made exceptions, as he so often did with what he saw as supreme heresy. Thomas Rottersley, the Lord Chancellor, questioned Anne himself and turned the rack when she would not betray others who shared her faith. Richard Rich, himself Chancellor for the Court of Augmentations, joined him in this venture. He had previously worked for Thomas Cromwell and would become Lord Chancellor himself in 1547, and he tended to switch loyalties in order to stay in the centre of court life. Regardless of all this, he considered himself a Catholic. There is no evidence to suggest that Anne Askew and Catherine Parr knew each other personally, 
as they never met and came from different social classes. Catherine certainly knew her name and Askew may have been in communication with the Protestant women in the Queen's household. Either way, the news of Anne Askew's torture and execution disgusted her. We have no specific date for when the following events went down, but as Anne Askew's death seems to have been a main contributor to it, the summer of 1546 is the most likely guess. Catherine kept her true religious views to herself and anything she did express tended to fall in line with Henry's to flatter and appease him. But there was still suspicion surrounding her actions with religious affairs of state, which probably began when she wrote and read a public prayer in English during Henry's campaign in France. Catherine seems to have overstepped her boundary when she told the king that he had, to his eternal fame, begun a good work in banishing the monstrous idol of Rome, so he would finish the same, purging the Church of England clean of these dregs whereof. Such words angered Henry, and Bishop Gardiner leapt at this opportunity to start interrogating Catherine's ladies-in-waiting. According to John Fox, who is the only contemporary source for these events, Henry did not take much convincing. I suppose when you tell the man who literally had his doorway bricked up every night so assassins couldn't get in, telling him there's a danger that his wife is of a different opinion than him is no trouble whatsoever. An arrest warrant was drawn up for Catherine. Fox's account states that a member of the Privy Council was entrusted with it, but dropped it in time for a servant to find it and show it to Catherine. She collapsed into hysterics when she saw the King's signature. Henry heard her distress and sent Dr Wendy to tend to her, Wendy was one of her sympathisers, who told her in confidence to save herself by conforming to the king. Later that evening, Henry came to see how she was, and Catherine confessed that she feared he was displeased with her. Henry comforted her for a little while and left. Once he was gone, she and her lady set about removing any offending items from her apartments, and decided never to talk amongst themselves about matters of religion. Later that evening, she approached Henry in his bedchamber, where his gentlemen witnessed their exchange. Your Majesty doth right well know neither I myself am ignorant what great imperfection and weakness by our first creation is allotted unto us women, to be ordained and appointed as privy chamber and subject unto man as to our head, from which head all our direction ought to proceed, and that as God has made man in his own shape and likeness, whereby he, being endued with more special gifts of perfection, might rather be stirred to the contemplation of heavenly things and the earnest endeavour to obey his commandments. Even so, also, made he woman of man, of whom and by whom she is to be governed, commanded and directed, whose womanly weaknesses and natural imperfections ought to be tolerated, aided and borne withal, so that by his wisdom such things as be lacking in her ought to be supplied. Since therefore that God hath appointed such a natural difference between man and woman, and your majesty being so excellent in gifts and ornaments of wisdom, and I, a silly poor woman, so much inferior in all respects of nature unto you, how then cometh it now to pass that your majesty in such diffuse causes of religion will seem to require my judgment? Which when I have uttered and said all I can, yet must I and will I refer to my judgment in this, and in all other cases to your majesty's wisdom as my only anchor, supreme head, and governor here in earth, next under God to lean unto. Henry countered her by lecturing, No, by St. Mary, ye become a doctor, Kate, to instruct us, and often time we have seen, and not be instructed by us. Catherine, fortunately, knew exactly what to say to mollify him. If your majesty take it so, then hath your majesty very much mistaken me, who have ever been of the opinion, to think it unseemly and preposterous for the woman to take upon her the office of an instructor or teacher to her lord and husband, but rather to learn of her husband, and to be taught by him. And whereas I have, with your majesty's leave, heretofore been bold to hold talk with your majesty, wherein sometimes in opinions there hath seemed some difference, I have not done it so much to maintain opinion, as I did it rather to minister talk, not only to the end of your majesty, might with less grief pass over this painful time of your infirmity, being attentive to our talk, my eyes, and hoping that your majesty should reap some ease thereby, but also that I, hearing your majesty's learned discourse, might receive myself some profit, thereby wherein I assure your majesty I have not missed any part of my desire in that behalf, always referring myself in all such matters unto your majesty, as by ordinance, of nature it is convenient for me to do. These words satisfied Henry, and he told her that, 
they were friends again. Neither Gardiner nor Rottersley were present for this, and the gentleman with Henry said nothing about the warrant. The next morning, Henry and Catherine were in the gardens of Whitehall, when Rottersley arrived with guards to arrest the Queen. Angered, Henry called the Chancellor all manner of insults and sent the men running with their tails betwixt their legs. Catherine begged her husband to show the Chancellor mercy, but Henry told her not to concern herself with such men. Until his death, Catherine never raised his anger again and kept her head down. She was safe, true, but she had come so close to being burned or beheaded that she was never going to make such a risk again. Only three of the nine depictions show Catherine's close call with Henry, and even then we have some alterations. I hope it will show up in Firebrand. It has to, otherwise they're throwing away a bought and paid for dramatic climax. In the Tudors and Six Wives of Henry VIII, we see the events of the warrant finding its way to Catherine and her supplication to Henry, as it is generally believed to have happened in history. In Six Wives, Catherine receives the warrant because Thomas Rottersley, I know there are many ways to pronounce his name like Risley or Risley, but I'll say it how I wish. He knows that Henry's failing health means that if he dies while Catherine is imprisoned, or worse yet, after she's been executed, Cranmer and the Seymours will avenge her by beheading Rottersley and burning Gardiner. But Gardiner's mind is set and orders his subordinate to carry out the warrant. However, he passes by one of Catherine's ladies and shows her the warrant and she passes it on to Catherine. She goes into shock from the news and is close to a nervous breakdown which Thomas Cranmer has to talk her out of. Spurred on by the Archbishop, she approaches Henry in the early morning. By this time, Henry's literally on the verge of death and while he is angry at first, he softens when he sees that Catherine is distressed. Is this actual emotion on her part or her knowing that Henry doesn't like to see upset women in his presence? and gets him to calm down and be willing to hear her out. Regardless, she manages to change his mind by the time Rottersley and the guards arrive. Henry, changeable as he is, is insulted by their presence and beats down the Lord Chancellor until he and his cotillion scuttle away, only for this outburst to be too much for him. He turns to Catherine, gasping for air, and while you don't see it, by the way Catherine suddenly looks down, I think we can take it as read that he collapsed. So overall, Catherine saved herself just in time, and she managed to hold on long enough for Henry's bad habits to catch up with him. In the Tudors, there is a little bit of difference as the warrant is exchanged through the servants who work below stairs, the unsung heroes. A servant girl brings the warrant to Catherine and she collapses in distress. Henry comes to see her as he hears her crying and Catherine immediately acts on saving herself and her ladies. Unlike what we usually see, this version shows Catherine appeasing Henry the night before the warrant is to be dispatched. It is generally believed that this is what happened, but having her change Henry's mind the day she was supposed to be arrested makes it work more dramatically as we have a ticking clock. When Henry and Catherine reconcile, he is asked if he wants to cancel the warrant, but Henry refuses and Rottersley arrives the next morning as Henry and Catherine are in the gardens together. I interpreted this as Henry taking the opportunity to intimidate Catherine and manipulate her into not challenging him again. The show has never shied away from showing Henry's dark side and I think this is the last time you see it before we get into the final scenes of the episode and the series. The Royal Diaries is unique in that it involves Elizabeth in these events. This being because she is the main character, but also because we know by this point how dear Catherine is to Elizabeth and is a demonstration of Elizabeth's intelligence. She, Robert Dudley and Cat Ashley conspire together to save the Queen and keep each other updated on what is really happening at court. Elizabeth fakes an illness that will cause Catherine to come and tend to her, so Elizabeth can warn her about the warrant. She and Robert secretly watch as Catherine manages to save herself just in time. It seems like a victory, but Elizabeth says all it cost was her independence. Therefore, she decides if she becomes queen, she will never marry and thus never have to grovel to any man. She likes having control and she wants to keep it. All three interpretations keep in the uncomfortable truth that comes with Catherine saving herself. That being, she has to compromise with her true nature if she doesn't want her own husband to kill her. She is the most high-profile woman in the British Isles, save for three-year-old Mary Queen of Scots probably, and yet she is no freer to be herself than any other woman. While a lot of the depictions show Catherine very briefly, at least they had their own way of showing how Catherine managed to be the one that survived, even if we didn't get to see her close call. The most any of these lesser-shown Catherines have is their introductory scene, or even just a small glimpse. 
The private life of Henry VIII is the only outlier, as Catherine only had two scenes, and they revolved around her being a caretaker, first to Henry's children, and then to Henry himself. Henry VIII and his six wives in the ITV series likewise have limited scenes with Catherine, but they still presented her as a principled woman, who will allow herself to speak her conscience. She speaks tactfully and calmly to Henry while demonstrating her compassion and intelligence. This shows at least that Henry was looking for a companion whom he could have a conversation at length with on matters of politics and religion. Nonetheless, both dramas still show that Catherine was scared of him right from the start, and she was always walking on eggshells around him. Six had its own way of referencing Catherine's inner turmoil when it came to marrying Henry. The context of the song is that she is supposed to be writing a Dear John letter to Thomas Seymour after Henry has proposed to her, and she has to call off their relationship. She furiously repeats that she has no choice in the matter, although if she did, she would tell Henry exactly what she thinks of him and reject him so hard he'd fall through the floor. The thing is, I can't say that. Not to the king. So this is goodbye. All my love. She did her duty, but did it make her happy? Of course not, and she doesn't see surviving as something to celebrate. She wants to celebrate her own achievements. Young Bess kind of has its own version of a close call, which, thanks to Elizabeth and, by extension, the French Navy, it is avoided. While Elizabeth, Henry, Catherine, the Seymour brothers and Cranmer are out at sea on the King's flagship, Henry confronts Cranmer over the translation of the Bible into English. But Catherine takes responsibility for it, as she believes the Bible should be translated for everyone to read. He gets uncomfortably close to her and starts brushing at her neck. To Elizabeth, this is all too familiar, as he did the same to Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. And she screams because she's probably been triggered by her trauma. This distracts Henry and she immediately claims that she just saw the French. Luckily for her, the French come over the horizon a moment later. Henry suddenly falls ill and Catherine's life is saved. The scene on the ship is from the first chapter of the book, but unlike in the film, Fox's account of Catherine's almost arrest also happens. Because Elizabeth is the main character in that as well, Elizabeth is the one to warn Catherine about the warrant, much like in the Royal Diaries. For all the movie's fault, it was an interesting way of working Elizabeth into the narrative and giving her an active role. It shows us how much she cares for her stepmother, where even Edward suggesting that Catherine might be executed pisses her off. So it has come to that, madam. King's law not heeded by his own wife, what a sad spectacle for the whole realm. You plead Anne Askew's cause, she is a heretic, but you plead for her. And after the execution, they'll send you back to Hatfield. Becoming Elizabeth is the only one that includes Catherine Parr but not during Henry's reign. As much as I hated the depiction here, one could argue that her bossiness, for lack of a better term, and her desire to keep within the inner circle of politics stems from her frustration at being an intelligent woman in a patriarchal society. This is why she goes ahead and marries Thomas Seymour without royal permission. This is why she lectures Elizabeth about her mistakes. We could have had it where she tells Elizabeth that she wants her to go further than she did, but we never got anything like that and the series just suffers because of it. Alright, this towel's gonna fall off my head, I may as well it. Whew, just washed my hair. And I needed to put the hair serum in, otherwise it was not going to look as nice, and I wouldn't live with myself. Catherine Parr's appearance has been the most varied and inconsistent when it comes to her on-screen portrayals. Only Anne Boleyn has been this lucky. 
as she is one of the wives to have her portrait survive after her death, and there is a description of her corpse from when she was excavated in the 18th century, it is undeniable that Catherine was of a slim build, with a pale skin tone, and had either strawberry blonde or auburn hair. True, in her red dress portrait, from a passing glance, you might think she was a brunette, but all it takes is another glance before you realise the red tint to her hair. However, like with Catherine of Aragon, Catherine Parr is often given darker features to make her seem more serious. In The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Rosalie Crutchley's appearance is in clear contrast to Angela Pleasance's, giving the idea that Henry's choice for his next wife is the complete opposite of her. In Private Life of Henry VIII, there Catherine Parr was only in there as a brief appearance, and her dark hair doesn't appear to have a thematic purpose to it in the way Meryl Oberon and Wendy Barrow's appearances juxtaposed each other. The same goes for Claire Holman's performance, as she was only in the series for a brief time and had a maximum of two scenes where she was the focus. Appearance didn't really seem to matter at this stage. But going back to the contrast thing, Catherine's appearance in Becoming Elizabeth being incorrect despite the rest of the cast being mostly accurate in terms of their real-life counterparts, is probably done to show the stark difference between Elizabeth and Catherine. You have Catherine, the snarky, judgmental shrew, and Elizabeth, the naive innocent. Catherine was someone who was world-weary and dissatisfied with her life, while Elizabeth still hasn't lost that part of her yet. Jolie Richardson's blonde Catherine Parr, again, didn't feel as if it had any thematic purpose to it, all I really gleaned was it showed that Henry's wives in this series were half and half in terms of hair colour, where half were brunettes and the other half were blondes. For obvious reasons, I'm excluding six from the segment as the musical was made with a colourblind cast in mind. Thus far, there are only two Catherines who have her actual reddish hair colour and fair complexion. Young Bess and Henry VIII and his six wives for the former, it fit well with the colourful aesthetic that the movie provided. Carr had naturally red hair, though she was persuaded to lighten it when she went to Hollywood. I haven't found any sources on Barbara Lee Hunt's natural hair colour, but Henry VIII and his six wives seemed determined to be as accurate as possible with these characters' appearances. With presenting historical figures who died centuries ago and have limited visual sources, a lot of the time, audiences are left crossing their fingers and holding their breath to get something similar to how they were described. To be honest, it would be nice to see the six wives presented as they actually looked, but if the person they cast for the role happens to be the best audition, appearance shouldn't matter too much. Anne Boleyn, obviously, is going to be the exception here, and she will always be dark-haired, while Jane Seymour will always oppose her with fair features. The rest of the wives are left to the whims of the creators, but as long as we get a good performance of the actor, I can't complain too much. What might have happened to British history as we know it if Henry VIII was able to have children with his latter three wives? Anna von Claver might have had more reason to reject the annulment if they'd had a child together. For centuries we'd be querying if Catherine Howard's theoretical son or daughter was Henry's son or Thomas Culpepper's, and Catherine Parr may have succumbed to the same fate as she did in real life just a few years earlier. Perhaps this would have led to Henry taking a seventh wife, and the Tudor dynasty would have continued for centuries if these children had managed to have offspring of their own. When it comes to Anna and the Cates, there have been several theories as to why they never had children with Henry VIII. Obviously, it has been universally accepted that Anna and Henry never consummated their marriage, but Catherine Howard was young and clearly understood what sexual intercourse was, while we know Catherine Parr, though in her 30s, was certainly not barren if she managed to have a daughter after Henry's death. One of the most prominent theories to explain the lack of Tudor children points straight to Henry VIII himself. I talked about this in my Anna von Claver Part 3 video, but it does bear repeating. By the 1540s, Henry's health was critical and his courtiers must have wondered how on earth was he still alive? His poor diet, festering leg wound, and the fact he was unknowingly poisoning himself with the lead in the king's plaster left him severely obese with limited mobility. It is highly likely that Henry suffered from diabetes, high blood pressure, and coronary heart disease. All these conditions can lead to inability to pitch tents. While these health problems possibly led to Henry scapegoating Anna von Claver after she already bruised his ego when they first met, how come this same scapegoating didn't extend to wives five and six? 
It might be that because his last two wives were his own decision and not chosen for him like Anna, then he was more willing to accept that they couldn't have children. With Catherine Howard, I'll touch more on when I eventually get to her last video. It is coming, I do promise you. But with Catherine Parr, by the time he married her, he had fully established the line of succession by allowing his daughters to inherit if Edward had no children. An extra son from Catherine would be nice, but what he really wanted at the time was a companion whose past he fully knew and knew how to be organised and look after his children. I know it's a while before Firebrand comes out, but the book that it's based on, Queen's Gambit, describes how Henry and Catherine's sex life would have played out. He is described as being incredibly rough with her, while Catherine has to lie there and accept it. He furiously tries to maintain his... let's call it a royal scepter. Oh my god, it is Monday night. Bonfire night was two, night was two days ago. Why are there still fireworks? Save it for New Year's Eve, you wankers. I swear, if I was Prime Minister, I'd ban fireworks. And cologne. Because cologne triggers my asthma and people reek of it sometimes. It's just like, have a shower. I can see why Americans ban fireworks in a lot of their states. Anyway, let's go back to Catherine Parr. And this involves strangling and cursing at Catherine. But I don't recall the novel mentioning any climaxes. Being not a doctor, but having a basic understanding of human biology. I'm just going to go Occam's Razor, which I originally thought was spelled Occam's Razor, on this and assume that Henry's inability to hold his sword aloft is the reason why he didn't have any more children after Edward. And when there was a little stiffness down there, he struggled to keep it. Either way, no one in the royal bed was having a good time. <laughs> Just when I think the fireworks have stopped, they start again. But look, I don't have much time in my day for, for my YouTube thing at the moment, but I'm gonna keep on recording because I want this video out this month. And no person with a tiny penis firing off fireworks when it isn't even bonfire night or New Year's Eve, or God forbid the 4th of July, is gonna stop me. And now's the time to get back into rant mode, which I'm already pretty prepared for, it seems. And said rant mode has been on and off ever since becoming Elizabeth first aired. I cannot believe how badly Catherine Parr was written in that series. I can never really let that go. I have spoken at length about how she has none of the compassion or intelligence that her real life counterpart had. But also, there was a golden opportunity to show Catherine writing her own projects. We could have seen her relief at not having to look over her shoulder for Gardner's spies, or having Elizabeth wanting to follow her example. Why did we not see that? That was the Catherine I was expecting to see, given that this is the only one that shows at length the aftermath of Henry VIII's death. But it's not just becoming Elizabeth that's guilty of neglecting her. Henry VIII and his six wives forces Catherine to take a back seat, so you wouldn't know she was engrossed in religious affairs unless you read up on the subject matter beforehand. I think it was definitely handled worse in the ITV series, mostly because she was completely disregarded. Imagine that you needed a passing grade for your assignment, and you'll know that if you write a quick paragraph about this one subject, the people using the marking guide will include it and you'll get that extra mark. That's how it feels. Catherine was squeezed in because she had to be there, and they didn't have the decency to mention her achievements in the ending narration. Young Bess is probably the worst offender of this, after becoming Elizabeth of course. Mostly because it reduces Catherine down to an emotionally needy wife, almost codependent on Thomas. She sacrifices her relationship with Elizabeth just to hang on to him. But we saw a glimpse of the real Catherine when Henry was still alive, who seemed to have disappeared the second he died. Such as when she met Elizabeth and her standing up for her faith in front of Henry. But honestly, I am more annoyed at becoming Elizabeth for doing this because it's been almost 70 years since Young Bess came out and we've had tons of interpretations between the movie and the TV series to learn from and there's a musical pointing out that Catherine was defined by so much more. And yet we have this version of Catherine who is so spiteful and never seems to genuinely smile. It's as if she's been put in a fan fiction by someone who really didn't like her. She's written uncharacteristically, out of character, to the enjoyment of no one. You don't have to make a character completely unlikable just to stir up a love triangle-esque conflict. We all know Thomas was the bad guy in this. He messed up both women, destroying trust and traumatising in his wake, 
We didn't need another antagonist at the expense of Catherine's intelligence. If I ever see this kind of interpretation again, you'll never hear the end of it. Anyone who knows anything about Elizabeth I or the circumstances surrounding her death have heard about the famous jeweled ring which the Virgin Queen kept on her finger. It wasn't until she died that the ring was removed and it was discovered to be a secret locket ring, hiding the portraits of Elizabeth herself facing a woman in a French hood. The big debate is who is in that ring. The two top contenders are Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr. The argument for Anne Boleyn is that after all the stigma surrounding Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth having to grow up with the fact that her mother was looked on badly, wouldn't the idea that Elizabeth kept her mother close all this time make it poetic? Elizabeth had many people close to her tell her what her mother was like, both good and bad, forming her own opinion of her. Just imagine Elizabeth in her few moments alone opening that ring and knowing that all her suffering was worth it in the end, because her daughter was the most successful Tudor monarch. However, it is a little short-sighted that we only take it as read that it was Anne Boleyn in the ring, because the idea it could be Catherine Parr is also plausible. Catherine Parr was the only wife she saw regularly and who encouraged her education. It's possible she only saw Jane Seymour and Catherine Howard a few times, and Anna of Cleves was a private person who was probably more of an aunt to Elizabeth, whom she saw every now and then. For Catherine Parr, she was not only a motherly figure, she was an inspiration who powered ahead with her religious beliefs and showed that a woman in positions of authority were competent. Elizabeth would want to remember the person who inspired her. And yet at the same time, perhaps Elizabeth kept her favourite stepmother close as a cautionary tale because she knew of the compromises that Catherine endured in order to survive. How she had to always keep Henry complacent, how she was forced to marry twice, and when she finally married of her own free will, she married Thomas Seymour, who by now needs no explanation. Perhaps Elizabeth held the image of Catherine Parr with her as a reminder that she wasn't going to grovel or have a man claim dominance over her. She had too many examples as to why she could not marry and keep her crown at the same time, and she'd already waited and fought for that long enough to relinquish it for the sake of her own whims. With Elizabeth I being dead and all, and time travel being a huge impossibility, we cannot get a concrete answer as to who the woman in the ring is supposed to be. Given that the figure in the portrait has lighter hair, you could even go as far as to say that is a younger Elizabeth, but again, we'll never be fully sure. This unknown lady has a diamond covering, where there would usually be a pendant on a smaller necklace, removing any hope that there might be a bee that would clear up all our problems. The symbolism of the portrait having the diamond and Elizabeth having the ruby has a metaphorical connection between them, so there is no doubt that Whoever this is, they meant a lot to Elizabeth in a way that she wanted to keep to herself. Both interpretations are valid. Personally, for thematic reasons, I'd like to believe it was Anne Boleyn, but if we woke up tomorrow and found out that the portrait is indeed Catherine Parr, I wouldn't be surprised. As of writing this script for the wives, Firebrand wrapped up filming and has gone into post-production. I wish I had managed to come out before I ranked Catherine Parr, but this coverage gives us something to look forward to. What I want to see from a future interpretation of Catherine is simple. I want a fully realised Catherine Parr. I want the intelligent woman who talked at length about her religious views and engaged in deep discourse about subjects she was passionate about. I want to see the woman who never got to raise her biological daughter, but nonetheless was a devoted motherly figure towards her stepchildren. I want to see the tactical player who managed to learn from her predecessors and survive Henry VIII's tempestuous nature. More Jolie Richardson's, fewer Jessica Raines. Make the audience hate Thomas Seymour with all your might. One thing I didn't like about Queen's Gambit was how it villainised Elizabeth. Don't do that. She's still a child. You shouldn't tear down one woman at the expense of another. Alan, stop sweeping your tail over something papery. Come on. This guy's absolutely crazy about me. He was so desperate to get my attention, he kept dipping his tail in my tea. Why would you do that? Unfortunately, I still haven't read the Alice and Weir novel yet, but you'll see what I think about Catherine's depiction when we get to 7,000 subscribers. I'll do it this afternoon. But I never want to see Catherine being reduced to a mere caretaker for Henry ever again. When it comes to the other wives as well, we have to move past the bitter old wife, the slut, the simpering sheep, the ugly reject, or the other slut. 
Just give me some nuance, I beg you. Show me something, within reason, that I'm not expecting or haven't been told before. Otherwise, what is the point of telling your story if you bring nothing new to the table? Since I started covering the wives, one of the questions I frequently get asked in the comments section is how would I order the wives themselves from my favourite to least favourite? And I never answered that question because I didn't think that was a very good idea. I pay a lot of attention to Anne Boleyn, true. She is kind of my favourite, but that is mostly because of what she has done for me. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was her influence that saved my life back when I was a depressed teenager who was only a few inches away of doing something drastic to myself. So for that reason I pay her more attention than the rest. But I never liked the idea of ranking the wives. They were real people, not characters from a franchise. They all had their own stories and lives. They all experienced some form of trauma in their lifetime, and Henry was at the centre of much of their misery. I don't want to be the person that says, oh, this is my favourite wife because, based on my own personal values and ideals, I think I would have had the most in common with them. I can't possibly know how well I get along with them. I mean, look at me, I'm a former Catholic atheist who's bisexual and won't shut up about Star Wars. I don't know how any of the wives would have reacted to that. Besides, have we learned nothing from Six? Alan! You've learned nothing from Six. Besides, have we learned nothing from Six? Comparing the wives with each other is a heavily sexist ideal. Talking about us, because as soon as we get together as a group, everyone notices Jane can't dance! <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about! We compare ourselves. Oh. And when we're the six wives of Henry VIII, we each become just that. <laughs> One of his wives. One of... Six. Grouping us is an inherently comparative act, and as such, it necessarily elevates a historical approach ingrained in patriarchal structures. When I started this Six Wives on Screen series, I just wanted to explore the wives and not compare them. The only thing I'm really comparing is the number of on screen interpretations each wife gets. It's alright, I'm nearly done. We'll get tea and chocolate biscuits in a moment. This was the easiest script to write compared with Catherine Howard Part 4, but once that one comes out, it'll all be put in order on the playlist, so no one's going to get confused. <laughs> if there is one thing I agree with Philippa Gregory on, it's the title she chose for her novel about Catherine Parr. In her literary universe of late medieval to early Stuart titles, she's dubbed this one The Taming of the Queen, which of course is in reference to the Shakespearean comedy biggest air quotes, ever, the taming of the shrew, in which a headstrong woman who speaks her mind and calls men idiots when she knows they're being idiots is married off to a man who admits to the audience that he only wants to marry into wealth and she is psychologically tortured and gaslit into being compliant. I don't know anyone who likes this play. Even when they made the modernised adaptation, they changed the ending so the two main characters reached a more equitable understanding in their relationship. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that the Shrew and the Queen share the same name. Shakespeare did base a lot of his plays on historical events, or earlier literary versions. I've seen one argument floating about somewhere that Hermione in The Winter's Tale is based on Anne Boleyn. But coincidence or not, there is no doubting that Catherine Parr's one victory to which she is defined doesn't come off as much of a victory at all. If she didn't suffer enough in life, what with the abuse's father-in-law, being held hostage, having to marry Henry VIII, being married to Thomas Seymour and dying in childbirth, her body suffered horrific treatment for centuries after her death. Catherine's story should be as a... Alan, will you please sit down? Catherine's story should be seen more as a cautionary tale than anything else. She could have thrived today, and she would see the battles fought for autonomy, suffrage, equity and dignity as too important to be taken for granted. I can easily imagine her chaining herself to a fence alongside Emmeline Pankhurst, or marching through the streets of New York with Audre Lorde, or denouncing fascism with Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. With Queen's Gambit or Firebrand getting closer every day, 
I am so hoping for this movie to not be bad. In its book counterpart alone, we had a perfect Catherine, who, spoiler alert, was even a gay ally. Yes, I'm not joking. If that's not going to be in the movie, someone's getting a smack on the wrist. Catherine's story and its bittersweet themes should be told more often. She deserves your respect and admiration. Please, let us not dismiss her as a mere nursemaid to Henry. She, like all women, are so much more than the men that marry them. Okay, depending on which order you're watching this in, this is the end of the Six Wives on Screen series. Of course, as of its release, I've still got Catherine Parr Part 4 to finish, and I want to do a redux of Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon, because those were my earliest rankings lists, and there's more Anne's and more Catherine's to talk about. <sighs> the heavy sigh is because... Netflix have just released a little series. It's a docudrama, but I'm going to count it anyway because they're so heavy on the drama in these things about Anne Boleyn and it looks awful and people are telling me it's awful and I tried to watch it last night. Like It's literally like the, this is the day after it's been released and I turned it on and I thought, okay, I'll watch one episode. I made it five seconds in and then I turned it off. It wasn't long enough for Netflix to automatically put the series into the continue watching section. Oh my god, we're gonna have to tackle that in a separate time. I may just do like one of those live reaction videos where I watch it for the first time, it's like the first time I've ever seen it, and then you just see me get drunk and angry because I do think I'm gonna be getting very drunk watching that. Thanks for watching Catherine Parr Part 3 anyway. I was glad I was able to get this done this month because I am working up until the end of uh, December, first week of January, so luckily I'm only doing morning shifts so I can like go to work early in the morning, come back around about two o'clock and then do some work until I feel too tired and, and I'm hoping to get another Catherine Howard video out by the end of the year because then we can start the new year with like, oh look the world is in front of us, we still got Titanic and we got rain vlogs but still we can be like oh look what ranking list can we do next and i'll let the patrons decide speaking of patrons how's that for a segue thank you to my wonderful patrons who've been sticking back with me through all of this since we started with jane seymour they've been great and i've really relied on the support from them to keep this channel going and to keep myself going and a big thank you especially to my king and queen patrons who are the highest tier of patrondom as it pertains to this channel Thank you, Alison Cuff, Larissa, Lady Eternal, Leslie Williams, and Jill My Nero. And if you like the channel and you're looking forward to what's going to happen next, please make sure you subscribe and you like the video, spread it around. Because I don't know how to appease YouTube anymore. I've been releasing videos every Friday and they're just like, well, we're not going to promote you. It's like, what do I have to do to get promoted, YouTube? Do I have to be right wing and horrible? Because I'm not going to do that. Anyway, look after yourselves. Hope you have uh, okay holidays. I know it's like just after fa Thanksgiving. I hope your Thanksgivings are okay. Well, hopefully Christmas will be not as stressful for you.